Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. We're going to give folks a minute or so to finish logging in. We're still seeing numbers increase. We're thrilled to see so many of you joining us for this webinar. I think it's going to be awesome. So you're really looking for a specific to see if we submit what's we need. Okay, we may have a few folks who continue to join us, but we do want to be respectful of everyone's time. Uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Terry Bearden. I am the Project Director of Organizational Capacity Building here at the uh, National Community Action Partnership. Uh, again, we're pleased that all of you could uh, take time to join us today. And I'm going to be turning things over to um, our uh, presenter for the day. Uh, we have with us Jamie Kleinsorge, who is with Missouri Cares, and they are the um, organization that develops and maintains and uh, has created the amazing thing that I call, that we call the Community Action Data Hub. And so um, with that, I will just turn things over to Jamie. I'll be in the background uh, handling chat and any technical issues that, that that may arise. So Jamie, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Terry. Um, it's good to be with you all this afternoon. Um, as Terry said, my name is Jamie Kleinsorge. I'm with the Center for Applied Research and Engagement Systems, also known as CARES. Uh, we are part of the University of Missouri, but we serve folks all across the country. And we're always very excited to talk to community action folks. Um, we've been partners with the National Community Action Partnership and then several state associations uh, for more than a decade, uh, providing data and really helping uh, you all uh, access data and think critically about what data are needed uh, to produce quality community needs assessments, uh, to help you do things like write grants, uh, develop programs, evaluate uh, your work, uh, all of those types of things. And so uh, today we're going to be spending time in the National CAP Data Hub. Um, if you haven't been here yet before, um, I'll drop the link in the chat here for you. So you're welcome to follow along. Um, the only caveat that I'll tell you is that you are required to have a username and login. And so if you are new to the site and you don't have a username and login, um, you'll see it says login up here. Ooh. I've already logged in, um, but there is a register for an account option. Um, so if you click that and enter your name and email address um, that'll send an email to our system and we'll we it takes us a little bit of time to approve those but uh, I've got my project coordinator kind of standing by right now so if you do register for an account uh, she should be able to process those for you pretty quickly today uh, so just a couple of things as I'm going through this please feel free to um, put questions in the chat. I'm happy to answer them as we go along if I'm able to. Um, otherwise, we'll definitely leave time at the end uh, to address any questions that you guys might have. I'm also happy to re-demonstrate anything. Um, so if I go a little too fast or if you want me to show you uh, some specific data or a specific area, happy to do that towards the end as well. So uh, without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. So this is the home page of the uh, of the data hub. And so just to walk you through some of the major features and functions, um, this first tab under find data is where we're going to find the community needs assessment tool. Uh, you'll see that's the first option here. 
We also have a housing assessment, mm -hmm. and I'll show you what that looks like. It follows the same process as the CNA, uh, but it's just specific data related to housing. And then we also have a what's new section that tells us a little bit more about what data are being updated or new data that are being integrated into the system. We also have a mapping component. So we've got some starter maps here, and then we've also got a map room. Um, I was clicking through the starter maps today and I realized that they still go to old ACS data. So give me about 30 minutes when this webinar is over and I'll update all of them for you. Um, but we're going to spend uh, some time in the map room today and I'm going to highlight just some general layers that might be useful to you as you're exploring issues in your community. Uh, and then we'll also take a deeper look into the environmental justice layers that were recently put out by the Environmental Protection Agency um, as that uh, is something I know that you guys are interested in and other states are working on. And so we'll take a little deeper dive into that. We also have some support materials as well that I'll show you at the very end and provide you with some contact information as well. So to get started, I am going to start with the community needs assessment. Um, and you'll see here, once I am in the community needs assessment tool, this is a three-step process. So you can see right here as I hover over the one, two, three, there are three steps here. The first one is to select your location. The second step is to select your data that you want to have included in your community needs assessment report. And then the third step is really um, is really on our side. It's for us to process the data and get it back to you. And so um, to start with uh, the location selection option, um, there are a couple of ways that you can go about selecting your location. Uh, so recognizing that this tool is for, you know, states and counties and organizations all across the country, we've tried to make it as flexible as possible. Um, so the first option that you get here is to be able to select a single county or to select multiple counties. And so um, I had the pleasure of being in New York recently, and so I'm going to use New York as an example. Um, by selecting my state, I now get a list of counties. And so from this list of counties, um, I can select just one county or I can create a region because I know um, some of you all serve one county, some of you serve many counties, right? Um, so you can select more than one county at a time to create your region. Um, this is important, obviously, to be able to reflect the area that you serve, but I also want to point out that this gives you the flexibility to create needs assessments, maybe just for one of the counties that you serve. Uh, maybe you have some partners in your community that are doing a community needs assessment or a community health needs assessment, and this allows you to bring data to the table um, for that county or for that community that's working on that needs assessment. Um, and it also really just allows you to, um, you know, be a little bit more flexible if maybe you're applying for a grant that doesn't serve your whole region, but part of it, you can really start to hone in and target the data uh, to reply to something like that. Um, so I'm going to go down here. I'm going to actually click those off. So if you make a wrong selection, you'll see that this little X shows up to each of next to the location names and you can remove them and start all over. Um, you can select many counties, like I had mentioned. Uh, we also have a state option. So if you are working at a state level or you're interested in producing a state level uh, assessment, you can do that by selecting an entire state. Uh, so you can see what that looks like here. And then we have some additional options. So uh, we had a, a couple of requests over the years for special geographies. And um, so if you are one of those special geographies and we're not reflecting it here, uh, you're always welcome to reach out to us. Uh, one of those is municipalities in Massachusetts. Uh, Massachusetts is set up a little bit different. I've learned that Virginia is like this. There's localities and, and counties. Um, Louisiana is like this with parishes. So, you know, every state might have a little bit of a different geography selection, but there are municipalities that are available for Massachusetts. Uh, we also have a Cook County suburb um, option just because uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of areas around Cook County uh, that needed to be grouped together. And so we made a nice little Cook County suburb option for those folks. 
But then we have two other selection options here. You can draw an area or you can pick from the map. And I really like the pick from map option because if I were to go again to somewhere like New York, um, I could zoom in here and maybe I am looking at data that, you know, I want to look at data that is lower level than county. So thinking about zip codes or census tracts or block groups, or maybe you're interested in a school district or a legislative district. And this pick for map option allows you to select those other types of geographies. So you're not just limited to states and counties. Um, I could go down here to zip code, for example, uh, and my map is going to load all of the zip codes in the state of New York. And I can go and I can start to create an area made up of a series of zip codes uh, from the map and uh, create a community needs assessment ba based on those zip codes and not based on just a county. Uh, so this is an extra feature um, that I think, like I said, is nice and I actually selected a bunch of New Jersey there. Uh, but you guys hopefully get the idea uh, that that flexibility is there. I'm going to go back to the county selection option because I probably think that's going to be what's most used um, uh, primarily by your groups and uh, go down to New York here. And I had the pleasure of being in Oswego County just recently. So I'm going to use that as my example. So here I just have one county selected. I have chose my location um, and I'm ready to move on to the next step. So the next step is to select your indicators. And so uh, what you'll see here at the top is that we have this easy button, what I call the easy button, where you can select all indicators and it will select all available indicators uh, within the community needs assessment tool. Uh, but that is going to produce a very long report. Um, and so sometimes that's the option that you want, uh, but did want to point out that you are also able to select entire categories themselves. So maybe you just want to look at a couple of different categories um, like demographics and employment. Uh, you can narrow down those indicators that will be included in your needs assessment to just those two categories, or you can select just individual indicators. And so this could be useful, for example, if you were Again, writing a grant uh, maybe that is focused on children. And so you want just those data indicators that are related to population age 5 to 17, for example. Um, so we have that data available, and you can start to create a really targeted needs assessment uh, for a specific population or around a specific topic, right? Uh, maybe the topic is uh, more around veterans or uh, folks over the age of 65. Um, those are also opportunities for you. You'll see here that there are a lot of data indicators available, and this list has been growing and sort of curated over the last 10 years or more uh, based on what we know that you absolutely need as, as the core for your community needs assessment. But then there's also some indicators in here that represent emerging issues. Um, you know, COVID obviously was an emerging issue for a while. Um, now we've added some broadband data because that's something that's an emerging issue um, based on, you know, funding that's coming down and um, the need for broadband across the nation. Uh, so there's some of those. And then there's also just some social determinants data, right? What are some of those related factors that might help you understand those core indicators better. And so um, so it is a pretty big list, um, but we do feel like all the data that are in here um, can be used uh, to support your community needs assessments and some of those other activities that you might be doing. So uh, one of the things I want to point out here before we move on to our next step is that you'll notice as I hover over any of these indicators, this little eye button kind of illuminates, right? It turns blue. Um, as I hover over it, you'll see it says see more info and I can click that button and what happens is I get this nice little pop up that tells me a little bit more about the indicators. So this is nice because if you don't know, for example, um, 
something like job earnings by sector, you know, what is that? What does that mean? What is that actually going to tell me? Um, if you click the little I button, it's going to give you more information. So what are the data attributes? So there's a lot of um, farm jobs and non-farm jobs. Um, there's a lot of supplemental data, so you can see the groupings of all of the different job categories um, and those types of things. So it'll give you a better idea of what you're going to get. Um, so I really like uh, having these pop up. Some of them include little inset maps so you can see also visualize what the data are going to look like as well. Um, so that's a nice feature. I think the other important thing to note here is that if you are ever curious about where these data are coming from or what the source is. Um, that is also included in the pop-up here. You can see, for example, this households living below the poverty level comes to us from the US Census Bureau, specifically the American Community Survey. And then it tells us how recent it is. Um, this is my little caveat here is that um, while it says 2017 to 2021, you feel like that might be old. That is actually the most recent data we have available from the American Community Survey um, and from other sources. So uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't get data on a regular basis. Like COVID, I think, kind of got us used to getting daily updates on, on conditions. And um, unfortunately, you know, we don't get daily updates on demographics and poverty statistics. Uh, they do come to us annually. Um, and they do have a lag. There is a usually a one or two year lag on when the data are collected um, to when they're actually processed and published. And so uh, currently the 2017 to 2021 ACS data are the most recent data that we have available um, for that source. And um, we get new ACS data towards the end of every year. Um, we did have a hiccup a couple years ago because of COVID, but I think they're back on schedule now. Um, and that usually updates then in our system by February or so. So without further ado, I'm going to hit this easy button up here and go ahead and select all indicators. Um, and I can now go to my third step, which is to create the actual report. I guess before I do that, I do want to mention that um, these are the ed these are the um, categories that we have uh, for the indicators. You can see here uh, we started with population profile, which is a lot of demographic information. Uh, we go into income, which gives us a lot of information about poverty and median household income and and those types of things. Uh, we get into some employment data, so looking at both employment and unemployment, travel time to work. Uh, we look at educational attainment and access to different types of education, so public schools and Head Start. There's a lot of housing data, and this housing data is also then reflected in the housing report that I'll show you as well. We have a lot of great other social and economic factors that look at things like the food environment and built environment. And then we get into some of our healthcare or health-related indicators, looking at behaviors, healthcare access, uh, different types of healthcare outcomes. And then we do have um, some special topics around COVID as well. So that's all that's in there. Um, I'm going to go ahead and click this reports button. So as I mentioned, the first step is to select your location. The second step is to select the indicators. Then the third step is to be patient, which is sometimes the hardest part, right? Um, so as you can see here, the data are loading and you can kind of get a nice sense of how fast it's going and how quickly the data are loading. And really depending on your internet connection, um, this could take up to a minute or two minutes to load if you select all indicators. And so just know that it is working um, as long as you're seeing sort of the, all of these different indicators indicators populate in your menu here, uh, you know that it's still working and just give it a little bit of time and, and it's it's doing its job there. Um, so this uh, menu automatically pops up and it's a nice tool to be able to use to jump between indicators. Uh, this community needs assessment is a long scroll and so uh, it can get pretty long when you select them all. Uh, so you are able to use this menu to jump down to um, or uh, jump between indicators, for example. Um, you can close it and open it just by clicking the, the blue button here at the bottom right. Uh, and when it, you can click the X to close it. And then this is actually called a hamburger menu and it opens it back up there. So I'm gonna go back up to the top here 
and talk a little bit about the flow of each of the indicators. So we try to set this up in such a way that it's easy to understand and easy to make comparisons between indicators. And so the first thing that you'll see for every indicator is what we call a stem sentence. And this is just a little bit about the indicator that you've selected in the context of the geography that you've selected. So here we can see that there's about 118,000 people in Oswego County, New York. We can see the total size of it and it tells us density. That same information uh, that we see here in written format is also then produced in a data table. The data table also gives us some additional information. So besides giving us those same values for Oswego County, we also get information for the state of New York and the rest of the United States. Now, these are very helpful benchmarks, especially when it gets into some of our later indicators where you're trying to say, well, we're doing better than or worse than uh, different areas or those state and national values. After each data table, we do also include a data source. So again, if you're ever wondering where do these data come from, how do I get back to the original source, uh, there's always a link that'll get you back there. Uh, there's also often this little show more details option, and that'll tell you a little bit about the data background, if there are any methodology notes that you should be aware of, or any limitations. Below that, if available, we'll also provide you with a map. So here we can see population density uh, by tract. And so that's one thing I want to point out is that the data in the table and the data in the stem sentence are going to be that county level data unless you've selected a different geography at the beginning. Uh, but when and where possible, we'll show you the data on a map at the smallest geography available, um, just so you can kind of see more granularly what's going on. You can click the view larger map button and it will open the map room and you're able to view that layer then um, a little bit deeper and, and dive in and move around um, and explore. And we'll show you a little bit more of the map room here in a little bit, uh, but that is an option. Uh, in addition to the original data table, which is sort of the aggregates, uh, we also provide breakout information. And so if we have it available, we will always produce the breakout information for age, race, gender, and ethnicity. Um, those are sort of the big categories of data that we get um, from our secondary sources. And so, um, and those are really important for us to uh, understand nuances within our community. Is, is there an issue that's affecting women more than it's affecting men or children more than it's affecting adults? Um, that This information will help us uh, figure that out and kind of suss that. That out. Uh, so we can see here then total population by gender, uh, male versus female. Uh, we can see, and this is every donut chart ever when it comes to gender, it's just about always split 50-50. Uh, but here we can see uh, the variation between male and female in this nice data visualization. As you hover over it, it is interactive. So just note that. Here we can see that same information then by age group. So it looks like Oswego County has a pretty good distribution in terms of you know, the ages of people that live in the area. Um, sometimes the things that you wanna look for, especially when it comes to population, are one of these donuts being much larger than the other. So there are some areas where, where you'll see age 65 and over is a majority of the population. And that really shifts, right? The types of programming and the types of services that you're offering in a community, uh, knowing uh, that, that most of the population is over the age of 65, or maybe it's a younger population. I'm gonna get down here to a more interesting indicator than just population. So I'm gonna go down to poverty at 125%. So that's something else that we've um, included here in the hub and it's also available in the map room are poverty levels um, at a variety of calculations. So uh, we have 50%, 100%, 125. I think there's 185 and 200% in there. And we do this because we recognize that you guys are out there uh, providing services through different types of grants and federal programs. And they often require you to know, right, how many people are living at 125% poverty or 200% poverty. Um, so those uh, calculations are made available here for you. 
If there's uh, one that is not is not in here that you're interested in having access to, let us know because we can definitely do that calculation for you. Um, for a while, I know when the when the Affordable Care Act was sort of in its height, you know, 138 percent was really important because that was sort of the line that they drew, right? And that's not a typical uh, a typical line for February, for the FPL. So, um, so those kinds of things uh, we're not always aware of, but you are. So please let us know if there's uh, any of those that we could help with. So this indicator follows that same flow. We can see that there's a STEM sentence here at the top that tells us uh, about 20.58% of folks living in Oswego County are living below that 125% level. Uh, that ends up being about 23,000 individuals and households. Uh, that same information then is reported in this data table. And this is really where, um, as I mentioned, those benchmarks come in very handy. So here we can see the state of New York and the rest of the United States, and we get this red number for Oswego County, right? Because it's higher than the state of New York and the rest of the United States. Oftentimes you're just submitting this information as part of your CNA, but if you are ever explaining it or trying to talk to people in your community, other stakeholders, um, having this benchmark information is super helpful. The average person, if you walk up to them and say, you know, 20% of my community is at or below 125% of poverty, they really aren't going to know off the top of their head, is that good? Is that bad? Is that neutral? Um, and so being able to say, you know, it's 3% higher than the state of New York and 4% higher than the rest of the United States allows them to have that context of, okay, we're not terribly out of, uh, out of line with the state and national averages, but we are trending higher, you know, and it also helps for when you're making goals, right? We want to lower the poverty rate in our county by 2% or 3%, right? To get down to that state or national average. Um, it really helps you kind of think critically where maybe we shouldn't set it at 15%, right? Because that might be really hard to meet. So anytime you do see a green or a red number uh, in these reports, it means that we can make that value judgment that you're doing better or worse than those state and national averages. Um, so you'll see that reflected in the data table, and then you'll also see it reflected in a dial. So the dial over here tells us that same information. It's a nice, quick visualization of the same information just to be able to see, okay, sort of how far do we need to move the needle, quite literally, right, to fall uh, back in line with those state and national averages. Uh, so that's just an example here. Um, let me get down to, um, I'm going to scroll down here to my education. So I'm going to look at educational attainment. Uh, that's another indicator that we include here. Um, you can see that uh, we have a distribution across high school, um, some college, associate's degree, bachelor's degrees. Um, and again, you can kind of start to see how Oswego County or your county is doing in compared to those state and national average. Averages. Looks like they're mostly doing better, but there are some areas where it's not quite as good, um, right? That graduate professional degree is a little bit lower The no high school diploma is lower, which is a good thing. Um, we can see that same information produced here in a map. We get a nice little pie chart uh, that tells us sort of the distribution of education across our population. Uh, we do get those breakouts for uh, gender. Um, as I scroll down, you can see that uh, we get into also, um, oh, those are both gender. I apologize. Uh, these are male and that's female. And uh, we move on then to our, our veterans educational attainment. Um, so they're like a subset, right, of that total population. So we can get a little bit more granular uh, depending on what populations that we're looking at there. Uh, so as I mentioned, this menu comes in very handy to be able to jump between indicators as you're looking at different types of, of data um, and different types of conditions in your community. 
Um, I can go down to something like violent crime and be able to see what crime statistics look like. Um, some of these are aggregated across three years. Some of them are individual years um, in, in those types of things. Um, there's a lot of information here in, in the report. And so um, I would definitely encourage all of you, if this is the first time that you're seeing the community needs assessment tool, um, to just play around. You cannot break the system. You cannot break anything by adding counties or adding indicators. Um, maybe you can. I, I see Terry's face. Maybe you can break it, but we'll fix it. I promise. Um, uh, but it gives you, uh, you know, it's really more of a um, an open system where you can dive deeper into some of these indicators and look for relationships and, and see if there's anything uh, new that you can discover about your community. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention was that anytime we can show data over time, um, we'll do that as well. Uh, so in addition to the breakouts, trends over time are also very important as you're reflecting on the, the, the types of uh, conditions in your community and what's happened over the years. Um, so here we can see, for example, percentage of adults physically active between 2004 and 2019. Uh, again, we get those nice comparisons between Oswego County, the state of New York, and the rest of the United States. So you can kind of see how you stack up. One thing that I'll say is that if we could produce all data with trends, we absolutely would. Um, unfortunately, not all data are collected consistently enough to produce trends, or uh, sometimes the methodology changes. And when that happens, we're not able to make valid comparisons. Um, and so we won't trend that data. So that's just kind of a little note there. Uh, but these uh, types of trend charts can be very, very useful. And this is really where your local knowledge comes in as well. Data is really only one part of the story and your local knowledge can help fill in a lot of the gaps. So as we're looking at something like the percentage of adults physically inactive by year, we can see that it varies, right? It goes up and down and there's a, some variation between year to year. And it's really your local knowledge that can help us figure out maybe why it went up or why it went down. Were there programs in place that help people like walking clubs or recreation facilities that, you know, that uh, helped increase physical activity in a given year? Um, did those close or was there some sort of, you know, change to the environment that may have caused people to be less physically active or be outside less? And so that local knowledge can really help fill in the gaps um, and tell you a little bit more about what's going on in the community uh, once you're able Able to dive into some of the data itself. Um, so what we can see here, as I mentioned, is that all of these indicators sort of have this same flow to them. Uh, the data visualizations, just to mention, as I show you, they're, they're interactive. So when you hover over them, um, you can get the actual percentages, uh, in this case, looking at obesity. Uh, but you can also turn things on and off. So if you wanted to just compare Oswego County to the state and you didn't want to look at the United States, you can click the, the words down here in the legend, United States, and you'll see that it turns it off and it changes the way um, our, our chart looks here. So that's sometimes a nice option if you're trying to kind of tighten things up, or maybe you're looking at more than one county and you just want to compare two or three counties and you're not as worried about those state and national averages, you can just turn them right off. This is another good example of a trend chart here. Um, again, same thing here. If we wanted to make it a little bit less busy, uh, we could turn off the United States and just do the comparison between Oswego and New York. The other thing I'll point out, it's a, gray, a little gray arrow here. Um, this little arrow will get you back to the top and you can see how long of a scroll that was um, to get you back to the top, but it's nice a nice quick button. So once you have your report the way it is um, or the way you want it to be, there's a couple of options for you to take it to the next step. Um, so first, uh, this download as button, um, it gives you the option to download this as a PDF. So you can get this report basically as is what you see on the screen as a PDF static document that you could deliver or you know make available on your website. There are two other options though. Um, there's the Excel table, 
which will give you raw output, raw data um, in an Excel file, all of these indicators. And so if you are someone who enjoys working with data in Excel, or maybe your organization uses Tableau or Power BI um, or some other kind of data visualization software, um, the Excel table makes it really easy for you to import data into those um, other types of visualization software. Um, and so that's a, a great option for you. And then we also have the Microsoft Word option. So it will give you everything you see here, the stem sentences, the tables, the dials, um, any of the other data visualizations that we provide uh, in a Word document. And this is really nice. And this was actually born out of community action because we gave you a PDF many, many, many years ago. And people came back to us and said, well, this is great, but we can't do anything with it, right? All we can do is sort of shove it into the rest of our CNA, um, but we can't provide any additional context or add data. And so the Word document is a really nice editable feature, right? Where maybe you don't want all of those data visualizations and you just want data tables. So you can delete the, you delete the charts and dials. Um, maybe you want to add additional data that you've collected locally locally and you want to create a table um, that talks about educational attainment or maybe you have attendance rates or truancy rates that you want to put alongside those educational attainment uh, indicators. Um, so it really opens up that option. It also allows for some of that qualitative data capture, which I know you guys do as well in terms of surveys and focus groups. Um, it allows you to kind of insert maybe some comments uh, from your community members. Um, within this report as well. So the one other thing about the Microsoft option too is that you'll notice that our charts are pretty standard colors, right? Um, and you don't have the opportunity to change the colors here. Uh, but if you export this to Word and you click on, you know, this donut chart, you can right click and there's options to format and you can take, make changes to the colors of the um, of the data visualizations as well in that Word option. So if you are looking for it to be branded your colors, for example, um, your agency colors or something like that, uh, you have the opportunity to do that as well. The additional report options that you see here, um, you can turn off state data, you can turn off those breakouts, you can turn off maps. I always encourage people to turn off the maps if you're planning to print this because black and white maps aren't very exciting. Uh, they're not very meaningful and people can't read them very well. Uh, so we do give you that option. It will also shorten your report pretty significantly. Uh, we also have these two other um, options here where you can sort your report by indicators that are only better than state average. So kind of looking at that through a positive lens of what are we doing really well at. Um, you can also sort by those that are only doing worse than state average. So where are we not doing as well? What are some of the areas of vulnerability that we might need to address? Um, and that kind of helps shorten things up. It's also a great way, um, you know, if you are doing this as a group or you're getting feedback from a focus group um, to be able to show sort of the good and the bad, you know, together and not focus on one or the other. We also have a source and methodology appendix. So if you wanna cite any of the information that you find within the report, uh, we make that a lot easier for you with that source and methodology appendix. You can also share these reports. Um, we make it easy to share on social media, although I joke, I'm not sure why, but you know, you can do it. You can absolutely share it. Uh, you probably would more likely share the short link or an email, uh, this in an email, and that's available to you as well as the print option. Um, so that's a little bit about the report itself. Um, as I mentioned, there's a lot of options here in this location selection. There's a lot of data indicators to dive into. So if you do have any follow-up questions, please let me know. And we're ha happy to kind of look at those when we're done here. So to move on, oh, go ahead. Yep. Uh, Jamie, I have popped, uh, I, I've collected the questions oh, that great. folks are putting in chat and sent them to you as a direct message. You've answered some of them. Oh, um, if you could take a, a look and uh, address those before moving on, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I can do that for sure. Uh, 
Okay, so um, somebody asked about showing details for cities. Um, the best way to do cities is to use that, um, the draw my area or pick from map tool. Um, that's really gonna give you the best option to, um, to get to like a city and town option or to look at zip codes that make up a city, um, that's probably gonna be your best bet. Um, we do use a small area estimate methodology um, to produce small area estimates, right? For things like zip codes or cities or census tracts. Um, so sometimes the margins of error are high uh, because we are making those estimates based on population. And so we won't show that data um, or we'll suppress it uh, just because we don't feel very good about it. Um, but uh, for the most part, yeah, you can, you can definitely pull cities and towns and you can see if I select city and town my map will change and it will highlight right areas of different um, designation city designations and, and those types of things. Um, let's see here. Can you add an option population below 200%? I think we have that. Do we not? Oh, yeah. So we have children under 200%. Oh, but we don't have adult or the total population. So yeah, that's something we can add and it is available in the map room. Um, so um so that's something that we can put back in the report, though, for sure. Um, somebody asked about gender. Thank you for asking this question. Um, I would love if we could uh, have a, uh, a larger spectrum uh, to report gender. However, we are currently beholden to the uh, data sources. And currently within a lot of our national secondary sources, so things that come to us from you know, the census or the CDC or EPA or USDA, um, they still only use a binary collection method. So it's either male or female. Um, so unfortunately at this time, uh, we are not not able to suss out um, any other, uh, you know, non-conforming or non, I, you know, uh, folks who don't identify as either male or female. Although I did do a presentation in New York, as I said, and their Department of Education, uh, where we get some data from for them, has three categories now, which are male, female, and not identified or or uh, other identification. And so I do think the good news is, is that there are a lot of data sources that are recognizing that you know, just sticking to the binary is is losing a lot of that nuance and is not very representative of communities themselves and of people. And so hopefully we'll see more of that. Um, but unfortunately, right now, we're not able to um, to to suss that out because they don't collect it in such a way where we can we can get it past, you know, the, the binary options. Um, so, yeah, let's see. I can uh, help with the Illinois folks um, at the end of uh, the webinar here. So, and then I think the last question that we had was around updates for the American Community Survey. So as I mentioned, uh, those usually come out from the ACS like towards the end of November, um, beginning of December time. And then that is the largest data set that we process every year. So it takes us a couple months. It takes us about a month and a half to get those up. So usually by the first week in February, uh, we try to have those available. However, we do do a rolling release. So as we have them, as we have indicators from the new ACS available, you'll see those uh, available within the map room and within the reports. So, all right. Um, if there are any questions I missed, I'll be happy to come back to them. Um, so the next part that I'm going to show you here real quickly is just the housing assessment. Um, it functions exactly the same way as the community needs assessment does. You select your location, you select your indicators, and then create your report. The biggest difference here is just around the indicators themselves. You'll notice that it's a much shorter, more condensed report um, focused just on housing-related indicators. And so if you are working on something related to housing or that's your specialty, this report might be really useful for you because it's very targeted there. Also under the find data, I just wanna mention that we have this what's new feature as well before we drop into the map room. Um, this will give you a great idea of sort of 
what we're integrating that's new, and then also what we're updating. So you can see here that uh, we make updates all the time. We're always flagging data that are out of date or that have an update available. Um, and so you can start to see uh, what we've made updates to or what new data we've integrated. Um, and that's available here and you can click and get more information. So um, that is also available to you if you're ever wondering what we're up to. We're always busy. <laughs> um, all right, so now let's get into the map room with the rest of the time that we have left. So I see the community needs assessment report is something that's pretty targeted, right? There's a, there's some defined use cases for it and it has a limited number of indicators, right? Cause it's, um, we can't put everything in there. However, we can put everything in the map room and we sure do. So we have about 30,000 data layers within our map room and they cover a variety of topics. So if you click on the little browse by topic, you'll see that we have a taxonomy here that looks at civic, social, economic, education, environment, and health. And as we click into each of these carrots, you'll notice that there's subcategories. So we can click into the subcategories that have subcategories. And then we finally get down to write individual actual data sets here. Um, we can look at the information related to them, just like we can in the report by clicking the little I button, we'll get some more information there. Um, we can also add them to our map by simply clicking the checkbox next to the layer name. Now, before I make a map, wanted to let you guys know that, you know, this taxonomy is available to you to browse by topic. We also have a browse by source section. So if you, again, are ever curious about where we're getting all of these data, um, this source list is a gr really great place to just kind of poke around and see what's available. Um, I always am surprised by, you know, where data comes from and like who has what and what data sources are out there. Hopefully you'll see some really common uh, uh, sources like the CDC and CMS and county health rankings. Uh, but you might also come across some new ones that you weren't aware that were available. Um, things like diversity data kids. There's quite a few um, other indices that are in here, the eviction lab, those kinds of things. And so um, if you're ever curious, you know, what data we have by uh, source, you can get down to the individual data later here, for example, within the FCC, looking at broadband data, and you can see all the different layers that we have related to broadband. Now, we have those two options, browse by topic and browse by source, but Google has conditioned us all to search by keyword, um, so we do have this keyword search. Unfortunately, we are not quite as fancy as Google yet, um, so this really is a keyword search. Um, so you'll want to keep it to one or two words of the type of thing that you're looking for. Um, so for example, you know, we could type in something like poverty um, and we get about 393 different layers. Uh, the reason that there's so many layers that show up for poverty is because not only do we have historical data, so you can look back in time and be able to see how things have changed. Uh, but we have all of those different poverty levels. We have poverty by age, race, ethnicity, and gender, um, all of those different breakouts. And I think if I put in uh, poverty 200 here, um, you'll see that, like I mentioned, we do have 200% of poverty in the map room. Um, and we'll get that back in the report. So you guys have that available as well. But you can kind of get, you know, it's a couple, one or two keywords that will start to narrow that search for you um, rather than what other, you know, what some people try to do is type a whole sentence or a question like how many people live in poverty in Oswego County, New York. Unfortunately, that is not going to get you any results in our system. Um, we are working on better search features, but um, again, we're not quite as fancy as Google yet. So. Um, but I'm going to go back here to the poverty layer just so you guys can see what that looks like. The most recent population below poverty from the American Community Survey, as I mentioned, is that 2017 to 2021. And if I want to make a map of that, I simply click the checkbox next to the layer name. Uh, once that's clicked, I can go down and click the add to map button and you'll see that it adds that layer to the map. 
Now, one thing that we have preloaded on here are the agency boundaries. Um, that's something new that we have. And so you're able to look at, you know, where your agency is and where other agencies are around the country. Um, there are a couple of ways to zoom in to your location. So um, much like Google Maps, there are plus and minus buttons over here on the left-hand side. So you could zoom in and start to see this data at a more granular level here. Uh, we also have this enter a location option here at the top. So for example, um, if we wanted to go to Arkansas where Terry is, we can uh, type in Arkansas and it's gonna get us close to the middle of the state there. Um, so you can type in a county name, um, you can type in um, a zip code or an address, and it'll zoom in for you that way as well. So once you've zoomed into an area that you're interested in, um, you can start to add more data. Uh, but the first thing that I would recommend that you do is actually click the map. So here we're looking at population below poverty. If I were to click the map, I'm going to get some information about the agency, but I can also get information then about the population below poverty. Um, we can see here that I've clicked on Pulaski County. Uh, we can see that the population in poverty is around 15, 16 uh, percent. We have a very small margin of error. Uh, we can see the total population in poverty versus total population itself. So wanted to encourage you to always click the map because it will give you additional information uh, more than what you just see here within the colors and the legend. Uh, speaking of the legend over here on the right hand side, that's where you're going to see your legend and any of the layers that you've added to the map. Um, so we have here that population below poverty. We can see the darker teal color is higher rates of poverty. We can see that brighter, lighter teal color is lower. And then there's also this gray color. And it says no data or data suppressed. Um, this might also show up in the report sometimes in those data tables where you'll see that they say no data or data suppressed. If it says no data, no data means no data, right? No data were reported, so we cannot report data that weren't collected. Um, if it says data suppressed, it means that uh, we um, have small numbers and we don't want anyone to be personally identifiable through this information, and so we suppress it. A great example of data suppression is if you live in a rural county, with maybe only a couple thousand or a couple hundred people, and there were teen pregnancies within the collection here, um, and maybe there were only two, we are not going to report those two teen pregnancies, right? We're going to suppress that data because if you live in that rural county, you probably could identify those folks, right? And we don't want that to be happening. And so um, that's why we do data suppression. Um, oftentimes, it's usually either a threshold of five and under or 10 and under. So anytime it's a real small number. The other thing that you'll see here is that we do have some additional options uh, within each of our uh, layers that we add to the map. So here we're looking at county level data. And many, many years ago when we started doing this work, county level data was the cream of the crop, right? Everyone was happy with county level data. Unfortunately, what we've realized over the years is that county level data often masks what's going on in communities, right? And we're serving communities. And so we have additional geography options. So if I click the geography drop down under my poverty layer, you'll see that I could go all the way back up to the state level. I could look at places. I could look at census tracts. I can look at zip codes. So anytime you see ZCTA, it's uh, zip code tabulation areas. Uh, that's a, a equivalent to zip codes. Um, and then we also have some options around school districts and legislative districts as well. So I'm going to go and I'm going to click the zip code option so you can see what that looks like. You can see that my map dynamically changes from county level data to zip code level data. And if I were to click on the map again um, and select my poverty layer, you'll see now that I'm getting zip code level data, right? I can see the actual zip code itself is 72117. Uh, it's got a, a percent in population around 26%. I can get margins of error for that as well. 
So um, we can do the same thing with track level data, uh, census track level data, and you can see within the counties now that we were so, that we were looking at that we have a lot better idea, right? Where poverty is greater, right? We see that they there's some areas that are much darker, some areas that are much lighter uh, that we would have never known if we were just to stick with our county level data. So that's what's um, also very nice about the map room here is to be able to drill down um, as someone, you know, asked to either track or zip code level or city level, right? Um, so that's one option. The other option that you'll see here is data type. So oftentimes we uh, pre present things at percent. So what percent of a total population is in poverty? Uh, but you can also see raw numbers as well. So I can choose data uh, type and I can go from percent to total. And now I can see those total numbers. Um, so over 2000 people over or between 1000 and 2000 under 100 or 500. Um, so we can get a better idea there to sort of how many people. The one thing I'll say about this, though, is that when you start to look at totals, um, people get kind of worked up about it and they say, well, I know there's more people or less people. Um, these are estimates, right? All data are estimates in some way, shape or form. They're, they're counts in time, right? They're capturing data as it was at a certain time. Um, so just keep that in mind as, you know, it's uh, it's always an estimate. It's always our best guess, right? So those are some things to keep in mind there. Um, I'm going to go back to my percent, though, so you can see what that looks like. And now that we have a map, um, you know, we were looking at one layer, we can actually add more layers to the map. And so there are um, lots of other data layers available within our system. So as I mentioned, we have over 30,000 layers. So we could look at something like food deserts. Um, we have a food desert census track change um, here where we can see change over time uh, in food deserts. And so I can click again the checkbox next to that layer name and then click add to map. And you'll notice that my map changes, but I can't really see the food deserts. And that's because if I go over here to my legend, my food deserts are at the bottom. Right. And that reflects to what's on the map as well, is that they are below that poverty level. So if you think about these layers being like pancakes, right, you stack one on top of another and you can't see the bottom pancake anymore. So if you want to see it, you got to move it to the top. And so I can actually drag and drop this layer all the way up to the top and you'll see how my map changes. So now I'm able to look at poverty and food deserts at the same time and start to look for relationships or hot spots, right? Where are great concentrations of the two? Um, those might be areas where we wanna do some additional programming or do some work, right? Um, so that's an option. We can even go further and we could add things like farmer's markets on top of it. Um, so the USDA produces farmer's markets locations and we can add those on top. They are small orange dots that I need to move up as well. Um, they're a little bit harder to see when we have, when we're not zoomed in. I don't know where we are in Arkansas here. Hopefully you do. Um, <laughs> but we can see that we can click on those points um, and we can get additional information about the farmer's markets itself. Um, we could add things like supermarkets. And so it really is a sandbox for you to start to explore conditions and um, you know services that are available in your community and start to tell a story. Um, so I think that's the other major thing that I would encourage you to use the map room for, right, is to tell that story. How far away are these food deserts from these major supermarkets? If you live in one of these areas, what's the transportation time? Are there bus routes? Is it walkable? Um, you know, all of those kinds of things are important when you are looking for funding or developing a program to address some of these types of issues, right? Um, I also encourage you to use maps as a, um, a conversation starter. So I think that maps are a great way to root everyone sort of in the same foundation if you're talking about a problem in your community um, and go from there. And, and the reason that it's so powerful is because when you show someone a map and everyone lives there, uh, 
people recognize we all live here, right? And we can see ourselves in the map. We can see where we live. We can see where we go to work. We can see where our children play or go to school, right? And, and all of that matters. And so maps can be really powerful in that way as well. Once you've created a map that you're happy with, um, you can do a couple of things just like you can with the reports. Uh, you can save it to your profile. You can share it. And I would say that these are great to share on social media. Um, we have that option. You can also get the short link or uh, send it via email. Um, the short link is really nice because it is interactive. So if I were to send this short link to Terry, Terry could come here and she could open this map and she could change locations. She could add additional data, um, you know, those types of things. And so it is an interactive way um, to share information with your community or to get people on board um, to care about an issue or to be educated, right? Do outreach. And so um, that short link allows for you uh, to do that very easily. We also have uh, some data tools, some advanced mapping tools that we have available. Um, you can query data, for example. So if we wanted to look at, um, let's see, our population below poverty, uh, we wanted to look at the total percent of population that's greater, any census tract that's greater than, we'll say, 20%. I can run that query, and you'll see here that it highlights a series of census tracts, exactly 37 of them, to be um, to be exact, that meet that criteria. And we can hover and see here that that's true, right? The population in poverty in this census tract is almost 60%. Uh, the one in this one is 58%. Um, and, you know, and so it does meet our criteria. Uh, we can show an attribute table and actually be able to see by census tract then uh, each of the, um, the population in poverty percentages. We can download this data to an Excel file um, and, again, be able to use it in other data visualization software or have it as a reference available. Uh, you can do this something similar with the select data tool. So if you want to just come in and grab some data, uh, you can draw a rectangle or a polygon. And I didn't choose the right layer here, so let me choose the right layer. Um, I can draw a rectangle. And so everything that my rectangle touched, it was about 112 census tracts. Um, I can get that to show also then here in a nice downloadable data table. In addition to the query and select tools, we also have measurement tools. So if you wanted to measure, for example, the distance between a farmer's market and a, a housing, a public housing location, um, you could do that. You could draw graphics. Uh, this is a nice feature. So if you want to draw an arrow to an area that you really are worried about or you want to call attention to, uh, you want to draw a circle around an area, uh, you can do all of that with the draw graphics tool. Um, you can use the mask tool, which I think is also a nice feature. Um, we can, for example, um, click on a county and be able to see, let me zoom out just a little bit. Now we're kind of zoomed in, right? We're looking at just that county. It really helps us focus in on the area that we're, um, that we're talking about. We can sort of turn up the transparency to see a little more of the area around it, or we can turn it all the way down. And now we're just looking at Pulaski County, right? We're very zoomed in there. Um, let me clear that so we can go back. Um, we also have a swipe layer. The swipe layer is nice to be able to look at like historical data. Um, you can, oh, I got my vertical swipe here. You can't really see much because I don't have uh, very exciting layers for the swipe layer on right now, uh, but it does allow you to kind of swipe or look at two layers at one time, uh, which is a nice feature. And then we also have walk scores available. So that's a little about the map room. Um, I'm going to stop there and see what questions we have before uh, we go on to anything else. All right. Looks like people are excited about uh, the maps, which I am too. I could spend, if, if they let me just make maps all day, 
<laughs> right? That would be so nice. Um, so you can export the map. Sorry, I must have, I might have missed that one. Um, so you can export the map itself um, here as either a, a PNG or a PDF document. Um, you have options for just the map or the map plus the legend. I will tell you, though, that because um, just because of the way the system works and because most people nowadays have big, fancy monitors, if you have a big monitor, you can screenshot this and you'll likely get a higher resolution output than you will from the export. Um, we have a new map room that we're going to be releasing um, that has some higher resolution exports. Um, but in the meantime, that's kind of my workaround is doing the screenshot because it gives you a better Better, um, a better view, a better resolution there. And then I did show um, if you wanted to just grab data from the map, that select data tool is really the best way to do it. Um, I did it with a rectangle, but you can also get a lot more precise and, and draw like a polygon. So if you were trying to select a specific neighborhood or a specific area, um, I didn't change my layer again. So sorry about that. Um, you could do that and you can draw a polygon and get right um, data for the polygon that you've selected and then the important part is to click that show attributes button um, that'll get you then this download to a CSV. It'll give you all that raw data there. So those are great questions. We're coming uh, to the end of our time together. I wanted to encourage anyone uh, who might have a last minute question for Jamie to pop it in the chat or unmute now and ask. Uh, I also, because those of you who know me, know that uh, I live for evaluations. So please uh, copy the um, link and uh, complete the evaluation after this session. And as I mentioned in a comment, we will be posting a recording of this session uh, to the NCAP uh, page where all of our webinar resources are archived. Uh, and so I will also follow up with an email to all of you with a link to the recording when it was when it is uh, completed. And I see uh, Alicia asked, uh, oh, um, Alicia, I think Jamie mentioned that uh, she will she will be following up with IACA uh, regarding your login information. Is that right, Jamie? Yeah, we can definitely follow up. And I was just going to get um, Jordan's email, too. I closed my I closed my email so you guys wouldn't hear any dings during the presentation, um, but I'll get you Jordan's email if um, you want to stay on here for just one second and she'll be she'll be happy to help you get uh, logged in for sure. Excellent. Uh, how often. How often do you meet? Oh, is this used for grant writing resources, etc. I'm new. Uh, so this webinar. Gosh, it's been a, maybe six months, eight months since you we've done one, but we try to do a couple a year. Um, and uh, the Data Hub is always available to our member agencies. And uh, Jamie and her crew are very uh, responsive whenever uh, anybody throws a question at me and I'll pop my uh, email in the chat as well. Uh, if, if anybody asks a question that I cannot help with, uh, I will quickly reach out to Jamie and the rest of the folks at uh, Missouri Cares and, and get their, uh, their help. But uh, please feel free to reach out at any time and we will try to uh, answer any questions that you may have. I'll just say one last thing is if there's ever data that you feel like are missing that you know are available out in the out in the world um, and you feel like it'd be helpful to you or other people in the in the CAP community, please let us know because, you know, uh, we try to keep up to date on what's available, but we can't keep up to date on everything. Um, so let us know because we're happy to acquire and integrate data. We also have a data integration option in the map room. So if you have like a layer, a local layer that you'd want to integrate and be able to view in the map room, um, you can always send us those requests as well. And we can do that um, and make it available to you. So happy to, to help talk about those kinds of things as well. And I did notice, Jamie, when you uh, went to the map room that the 200% of federal poverty level was available. 
yes. uh, there. So it's clearly just dropped off of the report uh, yep. page. So I'm sure you guys will. Uh, we'll get it back on there. Okay. I'll email Michael and have him put it in there. So you've got all those options. And then, yeah, if there are any others that are needed, please let us know. All right. Thank you very, very much. I, I made a comment that uh, I could nerd out on that map page uh, for hours, and I may have done that a time or two uh, in my in my life in my career. Maybe I'm not, not going to admit anything. <laughs> All right. Uh, any other questions? I don't see anything. Uh, thank you. I see a lot of comments about thank you very much, Jamie. We appreciate your expertise, and okay. I hope you guys find this to be a useful resource. And we will see you next time. Thank you, guys. Thank you.